Well, there's a term called hair metal. I don't know what they're referencing. I have no clue what they're talking about. I want to be respected for my art. Skid Row are an odd specimen. When they were formed, mainstream metal music was beginning to favor looks over actual music and songwriting. This was a band who favored Judas Priest over Poison, and Iron Maiden over Winger. They were a heavy metal band first, and a hair metal band second, and they were the kings of the late 80s and early 90s metal scene. Skid Row were formed in 1986 by guitarist Rachel Bone and guitarist Dave the Snake Sabo. They then recruited guitarist Scotty Hill and drummer Rubba Fuso. After toiling away with other singers, they came across a young wedding singer by the name of Sebastian Bach, in my opinion, the greatest singer of his era. He was only 18 years old at the time when he was hired. In school, Dave Sabo was friends with a little someone, maybe you've heard of him, named John Bon Jovi. And they were such good friends, in fact, that Dave was even in Bon Jovi for a short amount of time, before being replaced by Richie No Talent Sambora. And both John and Dave agreed to help the other one of them out if one of them ever happened to make it in the music industry. And years later, John Bon Jovi kept his side of the promise and scored Skid Row a recording contract with Atlantic Records, as well as the band's first major tour as a support act for Bon Jovi. The band then released their milestone debut album, Skid yeah. How, how did you find him? A raffle. A raffle. <laughs> Walmart raffle. <laughs> no. It was just, we were auditioning singers and stuff like that, and uh, we had found out from a friend of ours that there was this guy in Toronto who was a, a brat and was nasty, and he could sing and look good to boot, you know? Uh -huh. Disgusting so, as the rest of us. Yeah, <laughs> so he had that attitude, you know, so we sent him a tape, and he says, these are great songs, and we got together, flew him down, and next thing you know, he's in the band, and we're rocking. Yeah. <laughs> The debut album by the band was pretty much an instant success, having sold over 5 million copies in the US alone, on the strength of the two ballads, 18 in Life, and I Remember You. And I must say that despite the spiel I went on at the start of this video, this album, for all intents and purposes, is a hair metal album. A hair metal album with very heavy attributes, but a hair metal album nonetheless. And like other hair metal albums, it's very polished. Not saying Michael Wagner didn't do a good job producing because he did, but some of these songs are screaming for more gritty production. And as you can maybe expect from a band making their debut album, they are aware their influences on their sleeve. But that being said, there's still a lot of originality to be found on the band's debut, the main example being the fact that they created a more gritty version of hair metal, successfully toned lines between the sleaziness of Guns N' Roses, as well as the shoot coated hair metal fluff of their contemporaries, which critics praise this album for, giving birth to, in my opinion, the heaviest hair metal album out there. But not everything was sunshine and roses, considering John Bon Jovi and Richard Sambora convinced and at the time struggling Skid Row to sign to their publishing company before they were signed to an actual label, which, unknowingly to the band, gave Sambora and Bon Jovi the lion shares of the band's royalties when they end up blowing up. So yeah, fuck you John Bon Jovi and fuck you Richie Sambar and your overrated terrible band, you scumbags. But what do I think of this seminal album? I do like it, don't get me wrong, but I don't exactly love it. The pop metal filler fluff kind of ruins it for me, you know, tracks like Make Him Mess, Rattlesnake Shake, as well as the worst song of the album in my opinion, Can't Stand the Heartache. Yeah! But the album has of course its fair share of highlights. With this many copies sold, it's kinda hard not to. I mean tracks like Big Guns, Piece of Me, Sweet Little Sister, as well as the singles, as well played as they may be. With exception of I Remember You. I'm sorry guys, but this ain't my bag. It's too corny for me. And this is coming from a guy who fucking likes Steel Panther, so that should be telling you something. 18 Life, in my opinion, is a great ballad that isn't about anything typical of the time, like Hardcore. Gone Wild, though cheesier than a margarita pizza, I still love it. And believe it or not, the first time I ever heard Skid Row was from playing Guitar Hero DS when I was 11. My personal favorite track of the sound would be the White Heart Scorcher of the final track, Midnight Tornado.
And then to debut, as entertaining as it is, you get the feeling that they're holding something back. And Jesus titty fucking Christ, were they? We were playing in Daytona Beach, and I was uh, walking around on the beach before the gig, and two guys were walking around, and they recognized me, and they started going, I remember you, and like mocking me. I was like mocking myself with them because I was sick of me too at one point because they played that video so much. So then on Slay to the Grind, we were like, we're gonna show everybody that we can put out a, a rock song and then that's a big hit and Monkey Business was a big, big hit radio song. And it was a heavy song for that time. And then we had people in the industry years later say, you guys were ahead of your, like, you knew what you were doing back then because n not a lot of bands would have got heavier on their second album. But we, we didn't, we could do what we wanted to do. We had the luxury. I ain't the child of your Slave to the Grind. As soon as you hear the album's opening track, Monkey Business, you know they yearn for something much different than the first album. It's so sinister with that bluesy lick with Sebastian's soft song vocals, and it builds intention until Rubber Fuso hits that cowbell and boom, you're listening to a very different Skid Row. Again, this album was produced by Michael Wagner, and he definitely did right by the band here. There's some polish here and there, but it's on songs that in my opinion benefit from the polish. And the band even toured with heavier groups. I mean, for the first album they toured with Motley Crue and Bon Jovi, but for this album they toured with Guns N' Roses and motherfucking Pantera. They even asked Nirvana to open for them, but they refused, citing the infamous incident where Sebastian wore a shirt that said AIDS kills fags dead, calling the band homophobic. Now what Sebastian did was stupid, no one is denying that, but he apologized several times and he's done nothing of the like since, so I didn't see the reasoning for hanging it over his head for the rest of his life, like come on we've all made our mistakes. And let's not forget that this album went to number one on the Billboard charts, making it one of the heaviest albums to ever make it to number one. Not the heaviest, but it's up there. But the charts aren't always a definitive way to determine success, considering the album sold less than half the copies of the debut, selling 2 million copies in the US. So just because it charted higher, doesn't mean it sold more. See also Van Halen. My favorite tracks would be the awesome headbanger of Threats. Believe it not, one of the ballads too, Quicksand Jesus, which may come as a surprise because anyone who knows me knows that I am a staunch atheist and I have been since about 14, but I still love this song. The phrase Quicksand Jesus is about people who go to God as a lost resort, as they're dying. That's definitely an interesting subject, so when my time comes and I'm on my deathbed, you won't catch me calling for a priest, you'll catch me reminiscing of good times that have passed, I can tell you that much. Probably my favorite song of this album is the almost thrash metal title track, Slave to the Grind. So unfortunately, there is some filler to be found, mainly in the midpoint of the album. But nothing I'd skip, just nothing I'd go out of my way to listen to. Worst track would probably have to be Get the Fuck Out. Not offensively bad, but it's pretty dumb, and it sounds like a bunch of teenagers swearing for the sake of swearing. And in my opinion, this album should have sold more, because this is much better than the first album, in my opinion. And you know, because you've been watching this video so far, you know that I don't hate the first album at all. Quite the opposite, in fact. But this album is just leaps and bounds better. But it didn't sell more for a very simple reason. They. Got. Heavier. It's as simple as that. They got an audience who's more interested in their ballads and their Polish brand of cock rock, and by the time the next album came out, they couldn't hang with the speed metal induced chainsaw that was slate to the grind. Some could, but even a lot of them fell off after what came next. There was a lot of tensions. I wasn't aware of it as much as the other guys were, I guess. I never thought we would ever break up because we were so big. I didn't I didn't know you could make it that big and then just say F man, like <laughs> I didn't but you know, it, we're not the only band that both does. Or 
Four years go by after Slave's Grind was released. During this time, the band released the B-Side Ourselves EP, which was pretty good for what it was. They also took a bit of a hiatus from Doc McGee's recommendation so they could wait out the grunge fad. Though in retrospect, that may have been a bad idea. By the time they went into the studio to record the follow-up to Slave to Grind, they didn't even really want to. The band was on very bad terms, yet because of contractual obligations, they had no choice but to make a new album. They ditched Michael Wagner for reasons, instead going with Bob Rock, which Rachel Bowen has gone on record saying that it was a mistake that they didn't do the album with Wagner, as well as saying this album quote, absolutely sucks. The album also continued the pattern of diminishing returns for the band, with this album only going gold compared to the multi-platinum albums which preceded them. Not to mention Bad had no choice but to place more venues. The album only went to number 5 on the Billboard charts, especially after Slaves to Grind went to number 1 the debut went to number 5. The only single that did much of a shit was Into Another. And all of this happened because they weren't the flavor of the month anymore, and they still had a reputation of being a party hardy cock rock band, which in the mid 90s music scene, I'm pretty sure being a band like Skid Row was punishable by death. But you may be thinking, we get it, the album was a commercial flop, but is it any good? And to answer your question, fuck to the yes it is. This album is a darksome masterpiece. And if I have to be honest, this is probably the finest hour of the band's career. If not, then it's on par with Slaves to Grind. Bob Rock is a guy who, admittedly, has made more albums that I dislike than like. The main thing I don't like about him is his persistent need to polish and overproduce every artist he fucking works with. A little enough by David Lee Roth? Anyone? But credit where it's due, his production works perfect with this album. A subhuman race ain't supposed to be polished and pretty, and it's a good thing he realized that. In my mind, it's the best production he's ever done. And not to mention, the instrumentation is superb. Everyone is at the top of their game. Rubba Fuso and Rachel Bowen are locked in with each other so tight that they almost meld with each other to become one entity. Snake and Scotty's wicked guitar playing cementing the fact that they're the best guitar duo of their time. And Sebastian Bach, well, the motherfucker always delivers, you know? And they needed the musicianship. It's just like how Slaves to Grind was significantly heavier than the debut, this album is significantly heavier than Slaves to Grind, channeling the likes of Megadeth, Pantera, Alice in Chains, and Slayer into their music. And it's amazing that they got heavier as they went on. Not too many bands are like that, especially the bands from their era. But then again, maybe the only reason the album was so aggressive was because Rachel and Sabo was so pissed they had to spend more time with Sebastian. Something interesting with this album is this is the most correct Sebastian has ever had on a Skid Row album. And Baz contributes more with his vocal melodies and such, he isn't much of a songwriter, but the tracks he co-wrote are some of the best tracks of the album. My favorite tracks are Beat Yourself Blind, course, the uncontested standout, probably the best song they ever wrote, Eileen. This song is a really creepy vibe, and apparently this song is about a weird old woman that all the neighborhood kids were scared of and they thought she was a witch. Which is really interesting, because I remember being a kid and seeing some older people, they really gave me the creeps, and it adds another layer to the song because it's something a lot of people can connect with. track, I'm sorry but I don't think I can pick one. This album is a masterpiece, but if you want me to get picky, the hidden track tacked onto the end of the album after Ryan Will plays is pretty pointless. But if the worst part about your album is only forgettable little hidden track, then you have to be doing something right. But anyway, Subhuman Race was released to worldwide meh. The band did their fair share of touring, and that was it for a while, until the band were offered the opening slot on the KISS reunion tour, and Sebastian, being the KISS freak he is, of course jumps on that shit and wants to do it. But Rachel Bowen said no, because he was busy with other projects, and after this, Sebastian basically threatened to kick his ass. And to be fair, I would do the same too if someone was stopping me from opening for the recently reunited KISS. And after this, Rachel kicked Baz out of the band, which, if I can knock off my jokey demeanor for a second, I'd probably do the same too if I was in a band with someone and they threatened physical harm on not only me, but anyone. I guess I'm what you could call like a pacifist or whatever, since I don't think there's any reasons to ever lay your hands on someone, within reason of course. 
so I don't blame him for kicking him out of the band. Another reason you hear for the band breaking up, especially on the internet, was that the band apparently deemed themselves too big to open for anyone besides Sebastian, which I find very hard to believe since they opened for other bands on every tour previous to this for every album. So it doesn't make sense that they all of a sudden grew an ego bigger than the sales drop off between the band's albums, especially considering that they opened for Kiss on the Farewell Tour years after this. So if you ask me, this story is a crock of bullshit. It sounds as fake as Johnny Solinger's Sebastian Bach impersonation. Speaking of that guy, after this the band break up and reform as Ozone Monday, but after getting sick of their neighborhood cat leaving halfway through the show, they decided that playing bowling alleys was slightly better than playing petting zoos and puppet shows. They reformed Skid Row with drummer Phil Verone and vocalist Johnny Sullinger, and after touring for a few years they released the first album of new material Night Years, Thick Skin. So bring us up to speed, you guys got a new record on the way I saw. Uh, August 5th, a uh, new uh, record, Skid Row record drops in stores and it's the first one with Johnny on it. And, uh, the best one. <laughs> the first one with our new drummer Phil. And uh, so, yeah, we're really excited about it, man. And what's it called? Thick Skin. Got members changed, but you haven't put out an album in a long time, and that's what made us call it Thick Skin, you know, because everyone's like, this album's never coming out. They're never going to see a stage again, all this kind of crap. So Surprise. here we are. Surprise. Thick skin. You know, I'm a bit skeptical, but plenty of good music has been made by bands after losing their iconic vocalist. And I like to think that I'm pretty open-minded, so I'll give it a fair shot. Let's take a look at the first single, Ghost. Okay, decent opening. This seems like it could be a pretty good track. I feel the things I said, but never said how I Okay, the verses kinda suck, but hey, if the chorus is great, then we don't have anything to worry about. What the fuck is this? When did Scott Stapp join Skid Row? Look. I'm gonna do something here, so bear with me, will ya? Yeah, scary, isn't it? So Ghost eats rotten dick, but maybe the rest of the album is good. I mean, I know it isn't, but I like to create false hope. One of my biggest problems with this era of the band is that Johnny Solinger basically sounds like a lounge singer doing his best Sebastian Bach. And I've never heard of shit outside of Skid Row, so maybe he doesn't sound like this in a different environment, but here, he is trying his best to sound like Bach. And it's pretty shitty, I'm not gonna lie. But the worst part of Thick Skin is not only does it totally ape another style of music that totally isn't theirs and they can't pull off just once for the single, no, they do it for multiple tracks. Like the opening track, New Generation, even though it's an alright track overall, it's total Marilyn Manson worship, and Skid Row and Marilyn Manson are two bands I should never have to say in the same sentence. See You Around, which sounds like a Foo Fighters Z-side, and just reminds me of why rock music died as bad as it did in the mainstream around the time. It's because of shit like this song. Also tracks like One Light trying to be post-grunge, and the slow downtrodden horse shit ballads like the tracks Down From The Underground and Swallow Me, how awfully titled. Oh, and if it wasn't for Ghost, this would be the worst song by a landslide. A re-recording of I Remember You. What the fuck? This is as insulting as if Good Charlotte covered a Skid Row song. Or maybe even more so, cause Skid Row did this themselves. We don't have anyone else to blame but them. Also, the Good Charlotte reference really not that far-fetched, cause this shit is basically pop punk. And not even good pop punk. Hey, Simple Plan called. The being out sucked. But is there any highlights? Yeah, kinda, but nothing I would deem great. But it's golly by this album standards. Thick as a Skin is an alright song that kinda sounds like something from Slate to the Grind. A new generation I mentioned before I thought was pretty decent. But what do these tracks have in common? They all would sound much better with Sebastian Bach singing. But that can't be said for the rest of the album, I'm sorry. I failed to see how Sebastian could save a turd like Ghost. But hey, it can only go up from here. Well hey, a guy can dream, can he?
Revolutions per minute. Reunites Kid Row with the man partly responsible for giving them a career, Michael Wagner. So does the reconnection result in an album that can stand shoulder to shoulder with the records they've done in the past? Why would you even ask that question? Jesus, glue sniffing Christ. Well, you probably expect me to make more witty remarks of this album, but this album doesn't really give me a hellhole of a lot to work with. It's just so fucking bland. Say what you want about thick skin, but at least there's some variation between tracks on that album. There's only a few tracks here that I can even tell apart from each other, and they don't stand out for the right reasons, I can assure you. The worst tracks are plentiful, mainly because this whole album is a five course meal of dick. But it wouldn't be as fun if I didn't make fun of individual songs, so let's get into it. White Trash is an awful attempt at humor, which is about as funny as a child suffering from cancer. You Lie is a motherfucking country song, and I hate this song because I hate country with a passion. But I can recognize good country, and this is not good country, this is bottom of the barrel shit. This is about as genuine as Garth Brooks making a gangster rap album. And what is worse in country? It's incestuous, brain damaged cousin, Rockabilly. That's right, Skid Row did a Rockabilly song. I repeat, I'm not sure if you heard, Skid fucking row made a rockabilly song and it's just as bad as you can imagine best tracks there's not really any to be honest just songs that are slightly less shitty and that don't make me want to rip my own dick off and rachel bowen wrote this entire album save for four tracks and rachel i love you you're probably my favorite member of the band but what the fuck are you doing here this shit is terrible without Question the worst Skid Row album by a country fucking mile. Avoid it at all costs. United World Rebellion Chapters 1 and 2 Rachel said that he had the idea to release three EPs over the course of a few years so that it's easier than to record a full length album all at once and that by the end of releasing all the EPs, the fans will have a cohesive album. And maybe this would work better if you haven't fired your singer before completing said three EPs? I mean, I can't imagine how cohesive an album could be with a different singer all of a sudden coming in mid-album. I mean, come on guys, you're not Napalm Death. And I'm reviewing both releases in this one segment because one, they're kind of supposed to be viewed as one cohesive piece, two, these segments would be very short-lived if I had to separate them, and three, I'm just kind of lazy. But the music, is it any good? Surprisingly, it ain't half bad. Though nothing is mind-blowing, nothing insults my senses either, so that's an improvement. The best track from both of these releases would have to be the opener to side two, We Are The Damned. As I put on this EP for the first time, I found myself unintentionally bubbing my head to an awesome riff. Give It The Gun is also good, and overall I have to say the second EP is significantly better than the first, which overall I thought was just okay. And as a whole, I think it's by far the best shit they've done since Baz was given the boot. And on these EPs, Johnny Solinger doesn't sound like a complete ape of Sebastian. I mean, he does still sound very summer, but he is starting to slowly drift away. But despite how much of an improvement these EPs are, I still can't help but imagine how much better it would sound with Sebastian on the mic, I'm sorry. And it wouldn't be so apparent how lackluster the post bach albums are if Sebastian's solo work wasn't as solid as it is. I mean, why would I listen to Skid Row without Bach, who at best are okay, and at worst like the manifestation of every time you've ever been kicked in the balls, when I could listen to Sebastian's solo work which consistently delivers. But anyway, it seems as though they were getting better as the EPs went on, and who knows, the final EP could have been legitimately good, it isn't impossible, but they instead decided to fire Johnny Solinger because reasons. And it was kind of funny because he came out a few days before the band could give an official statement saying, oh I'm leaving on my own to focus on my solo work, and Rachel came out and said, no, we fired him. No man, you didn't decide to leave Skid Row to focus on your own solo work. The band decided for you. After this, they hired Tony Harnell, who in my opinion was a much better replacement to Bach than Solinger ever was. Nothing against the guy, I mean, he isn't a bad singer, I've certainly heard worse, and he seems like a nice enough guy, but the dude was out of his league, let's be honest. And Tony Harnell is most well known for being in the 80s band TNT, and even though I thought they were kinda sorta a really shitty band in my opinion, I always thought the guy had a really nice pair of pipes. And the main reason I thought he was good in Skid Row was the fact he didn't try and sound like Bach. He sang the songs in his own style, and even though he doesn't do a be vocals which leaves a bit to be desired but I would rather a different take on the song than a glorified tribute singer being the band. And seeing that Skid Row would spend the rest of their career with Tony, 
until after being in the band for a full 15 minutes, after which he announced his exit in the group on his Facebook page. And my only problem with this being that he didn't tell the band beforehand that he was leaving. I mean, the band found out that he was leaving on their fucking Facebook. Like, dude, can you be any more unprofessional? After this, of course, the reunion rumors popped up for the 1500th time, which don't get me wrong, I would love to see a Skid Row reunion. But let's play devil's advocate for a minute. Rachel Bowen hates Sebastian Bach and vice versa. Those two can't hang with each other for whatever reason. And look, Skid Row is Rachel's band. Yeah, I know Snake also formed the band with him too, but it's pretty clear who pulls the shots. And Rachel wants nothing to do with him. And as fans looking in from the outside, we can only see so much. And Sebastian, you can tell, the dude is out there, and he's quite obnoxious. He reminds me of the crazy guy we all remember from high school. And sometimes he's crazy in a good way, like when he performs. But sometimes he also seems to be crazy in very bad ways, too. Like when he picked a fight with an 80-year-old man, William Shatner. I mean, how the fuck do you even do that, man? I'm more impressed than anything. Let's play Devil's Devil's Advocate. So they don't want to associate themselves with Sebastian Bach, and they don't care that they play phone blues. That's fair enough, but if you really don't care, drop the name Skid Row. So many people still associate Bach with the band as the frontman and singer. And if you change a name, no one will be bitching to get Sebastian in the band, I guarantee it. But anyway, they end up replacing Tony Arnell with ZP who they played with on tour for a full year without even officially naming him the new singer, which is kind of funny. And ZP is a guy you may remember from this. Yeah, I know, I don't think it fits either. They have announced that they're gonna make the third EP to finish the United World Rebellion trilogy, so it seems as though he's in it for the long run. Unfortunately, and I'm sorry to say this, but I don't think this guy fits at all. I mean, this guy's voice goes through peaks and valleys. Not over the course of a few shows, but over the course of a few songs in the set. Shit, not only that, but over the course of a few fucking notes. I mean, one second he sounds identical to Bach and he sounds great, and then the next minute he sounds like King Diamond's retarded cousin. There's no consistency. I don't think he knows how to sing this kind of music. I mean, this guy can sing power metal, pretty good, but he can't sing Skid Row's brand of cock rock in my opinion. For instance, Johnny Sellinger, say what you want about the guy, but at least he stays on the same plane of mediocrity throughout the show. For love of God, never let that guy sing a ballad again. But anyway, that's my retrospective of the one and only Skid Row. And despite my distaste for the latter half of their career and the way I pretty much believe that they shut themselves in a foot, nothing will sway my love for the music I love from this band. And they're still legends in my mind, and when we're all dead and gone in the ground, the music will live on. Subscribe to Discord Admins.